this is being done outside the organized labor structures of the normal trade union. We're planning to continue to strike the first of every month until some basic fundamental demands are met. We are encouraging everybody to join us the first of every month. We want to make this international because this pandemic is international uh, and the crisis, you know, underneath it and the structure of capitalism that, that underscores that, uh, which breeds inequality and exploitation. Uh, that is a global phenomenon and we have to fight it globally. Something new is happening in the world. I have been monitoring for the Protect Essential Workers group on Facebook strikes and actions and protests by essential workers all over the world. Four weeks ago, I was looking for a very small number of isolated protests by 20 nurses here or 15 nurses there to put up. In the last three days, the amount of activity across the world is just increasing hand over fist. There is no way I can keep up with it. This week, the health unions in Kenya threatened a national strike, went into negotiations with the government and won what they were looking for and called off the strike. The health union in Zimbabwe did the same this week. Wednesday night, all of the doctors in Lagos, a city of 12 million people, went on strike at eight o'clock on Wednesday night. By early Thursday morning, the head of the security services announced that the doctors had won their strike. The doctors in Pakistan have been putting on black armbands in, pr in protest about having no safety. Yesterday, Doctors and nurses all over India began putting on black armbands. The health workers union in Albania announced yesterday that they were going to call a national strike if they didn't get proper help. This is escalating globally. It's manual workers who nobody has ever paid any attention to before. There's an enormous number of actions by bus workers from Papua New Guinea to Detroit to Bogota. I mean, this is... We're just beginning now. It's just in the last week really begun to take off. It's going to be bigger by the time we get to June the 1st. And it's going to be much bigger as we really enter into the recession. We're entering a time of great recession. And after that, the time of terrible climate change. your old school, you know, uh, work workers at, uh, uh, particularly male workers, as some people used to look at it, at some factory. It's a much more broad and comprehensive piece that we're calling for. Uh, and we're really trying to stop and make an impact on how capital is accumulated, how money is made uh, for these corporations and, and, you know, at the behest and in the, in the endowment of many of these governments uh, at three critical points, you know, Wherever, whether you're working from home or working at, you know, some corporate office or a grocery store or a meatpacking plant, wherever, you know, take action there to the degree that you can. You know, so no work basically is a fundamental first piece. The second piece, to be in solidarity with those folks who have to work at Amazon and Target and places like that, no shopping, you know, to give them cover, to give them some protection and to be in solidarity with them to send a clear message home. And then the third critical piece uh, is no rent or no mortgage payment. An unprecedented coalition of essential workers from Amazon, Instacart, Whole Foods, Walmart, Target, and FedEx are calling out sick or walking out during their lunch break to demand better health and safety conditions along with hazard pay. Others are joining them calling for a people's bailout. It's a pleasure to be here with so many powerful, prominent um, activists and organizations and working class people from all over the world. This is an honor. Um, this is what it's all about, solidarity. Um, and I think we're showing that today with everybody participating and everybody that's watching from home that's uh, viewing this. The time is now to change during this pandemic. Um, I think that this is the window of opportunity for us to show what we really need to do as far as taking the power back 
from capitalism. What I did on March 30th uh, at Amazon, uh, losing my job, putting my five-year tenure on the line to stand up about health and safety concerns was something I felt as, you know, anybody that's a, a, a decent human being would do. Um, I wasn't an organizer before then. I was catapulted into the spotlight. Uh, I had to learn how to become an organizer, and I'm still learning every day. But as I learn and I talk to people from all over the world, um, I embrace this moment, I embrace this opportunity, and I'm so grateful to be a part of this movement because it's so needed. Um, working with the, uh, the, the people that I work with that's a part of our communities that are affected the most, the black and brown um, communities, the urban areas of America, um, we have been subjected and deemed as essential workers, but we're not treated as essential. Our health is very essential. We are part of the communities. And these billionaires and these one percenters that they don't understand that because they are not a part of the communities. They're not in the trenches where we are. Um, they're in their million dollar mansions away from these type of communities that are being affected the most. And they're telling us to go back to work and make the money for them. This is the modern day slavery. This is the modern day uh, uh, breaking of the change right here. What we're doing right now, we have to break the change from that. We have to come together all over the globe as one and unite on whatever movement, whatever cause, putting aside your logos, putting aside what company, companies that you work for, putting aside what organization you represent. At the end of the day, this is about people. And um, I believe that what we're doing on the first of the month, what we uh, demonstrated on May 1st, was just the beginning. Us expanding internationally shows the true grit, the true meaning behind uh, standing up for people's rights, workers' rights, civil rights, and uh, ultimately uh, social justice and uh, the new generation uh, civiliz civilization that we need to create for the working, working class people for future generations. What I would like to see going forward is to just continue these type of calls and uh, these type of conversations and communication where we all can just come together and show the people that we're continuing to fight with them um, together and standing together in solidarity. Um, this is what it's all about. And I'm so happy to be a part of this. And I'm looking forward to working with each and every one of you. And I hope everybody um, here on the call reaches out to me and we all stay connected uh, going forward because I believe that this is the way that we're gonna uh, make great change in the world. We're not going to just keep abiding by uh, the same old rules, structures, and games. Uh, we're not gonna die for their profit. Uh, but we have to be in solidarity with each other on a mass level to accomplish that. And so we know this is going to take time. There's many millions of people who need some convincing. Uh, and I think we have to struggle with our people very patiently, very diligently, pointing out the facts. En Suiza, como vio en el video, teníamos planificado una huelga nacional. Esa huelga eh, estaba preparada por un colectivo que se llama el colectivo para la, la huelga para el 15 de mayo. Eh, empezamos a hacer ese colectivo en Ginebra para que sea di diversificado, o sea, que, que, que haya movimientos, eh, asociaciones, ONG, otros colectivos, pero sobre todo sindicatos, porque no, nos pareció es fundamental de implicar los trabajadores y, los traba y las trabajadoras para, eh, porque ellos lle llevan eh, con ellos la, la producción y la economía en las luchas y, eh, y, lo más impor y, lo, y era importante para nosotros de poder trabajar juntos. La relación entre la justicia social y climática es indisociable y es fundamental la precariedad y la destrucción de la naturaleza 
tienen los mismos enemigos, que es el sistema capitalista y eh, la política neoliberal. Claro que algunos sectores de trabajo eh, aún serán más afectados que otros por la transición ecológica que, ese, que, que pedimos, pero no queremos una transición ecológica eh, capitalista, verde, no puede ser una justicia climática sin justicia social, es imposible. Cuando hablamos de solidaridad, tiene que ser solidaridad en, la, en las ciudades de aquí, pero también en la, en, en, de manera internacional. Yo como chilena, pues la, la situación en Chile ahora está muy grave, eh, con la situación del COVID, eh, la gente está muriendo de hambre, eh, hay que saber que en Chile, por ejemplo, la gente no tiene acceso a lo, los medios médicos, o sea, hay gente que muere esperando de poderse hacer operar al delante del COVID. Todo está privatizado, ni siquiera tienen acceso al agua, al agua potable. Y eso, el agua potable, está tenido por multinacionales, multinacionales que tienen plata aquí en Suiza con las bancas. Y aquí en Suiza también los bancos hacen inversiones de combustibles fósiles, y, uh, y, y todo eso está, está, está junto, tiene toda relación. El problema aquí en Suiza dicen que el problema climático está pasando a segundo paso porque hay el problema de la salud, pero todo está, todo está junto, no se puede dejar ni uno ni el otro, y por eso es que es importante y yo encuentro formidable que estemos tantos esta noche. Eh, yo llamo sobre todo a la solidaridad, a, a acciones juntos, y, y es importante que sea todo a la ayuda de, 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 de los trabajadores, eh, que sea en el, en el sur como en el norte. Just the fact that they have lost one of them to COVID-19 makes their coming out to the street a very serious matter. And I, as a community representative and leader of the human rights, the alpha human rights in this province, I support their call for a full investigation into the death Of nurse Gremios del personal de la salud de Argentina realizaron una jornada nacional de protestas en demanda de una mayor provisión de elementos de protección ante la pandemia del coronavirus, el pago de un bono adicional durante cuatro meses y la apertura de negociaciones paritarias para un aumento salarial. El 14% de los trabajadores de salud ya estamos contagiados. Más de 40 organizaciones se adhirieron a la protesta, que constó de marchas manteniendo el distanciamiento social y huelgas laborales, pero preservando las guardias y la atención de infectados de COVID-19. Son los internos del penal Castro Castro al noreste de Lima, en Perú, sector donde además se registra el mayor número de contagios de COVID-19. Ayer por la tarde se iniciaba el violento motín que ha dejado nueve prisioneros fallecidos y 67 heridos, entre ellos policías y funcionarios del ejército. Hay muchos internos que están muertos, de, están heridos y así se van a morir todos, es que no hay, no hay atención acá. Ahorita no hay agua, le han quitado el agua todo y no pueden hacer nada. Se tomaron el penal exigiendo mayor atención médica y que además sean considerados en los 3.000 indultos que el presidente Martín Vizcarra prometió para los próximos días. Eso para grupos de prisioneros vulnerables ante la pandemia. ¡Prueba rápida para todos! ¡Prueba rápida! Nuestro cuerpo médico y todos los trabajadores de salud nos encontramos en guerra, en la primera línea. La falta de equipos de bioseguridad, ventiladores, el colapso de los hospitales públicos, la falta de dotación y pruebas rápidas que detecten el virus, es lo que denuncian desde el personal médico del hospital Luis Negreiros en Lima. Actualmente tenemos nueve trabajadores de salud infectados, dentro de ellos dos médicos. Un médico actualmente hospitalizado en la unidad de COVID. Ante esta contingencia yo he llamado a Ciudad Juárez el tren de la muerte. El tren de la muerte porque ninguna empresa ha suspendido labores de acuerdo al decreto de emergencia sanitaria. Me llamo Judith Covarrubias Gallardo, trabajo aquí en Electrocomponentes y estamos pasando una situación muy grave. Nos quieren mandar con el 50% a la casa y... Eso no, no nos merecemos, queremos el 100%. Y pues también tenemos miedo de llegar y e infectar a nuestras familias, a nuestros hijos, porque pues no hay medios de, de, pues sí, de higiene, nomás nos dan un cubrebocas, nosotros tenemos que comprar un cubrebocas y se supone que esos cubrebocas duran nomás tres horas y no nos los cambian. A mí no se me hace justo que nos vayamos nada más nosotros con el 50% y administrativo se vaya con 100% de su sueldo, este, pues el tiempo que sea necesario porque supuestamente esta empresa cerró desde el 30 de marzo oiga, y nosotros seguimos trabajando. Todos los días hay muertos, a mí me dan 16 muertos en Lir Río Bravo, a mí me dan 3 muertos en Rigal, a mí me dan 5 muertos en Sincreón, a mí me da un muerto en Inventec, 
A mí me dan dos muertos en Comscope. A mí no me da el número de amor, dos muertos en Toro Company. Vamos a tener cientos de muertes, sino que miles de muertes. Tenemos plantas que tienen 5,000 trabajadores por turno, como Foxconn de las Torres. Y ahí yo pienso que el resultado de estos actos criminales por omisión, de omitir cumplir el decreto de emergencia sanitaria, va a resultar con la muerte de muchos pobres. Pakistan is a country which is producing a cotton and cotton related uh, all the apparel for international markets. So you call the name of any brand and then brand is getting all their merchandise from Pakistan. So around uh, in a Pakistan there are the 68 million workforce out of which around the 70% is engaged with the textile and garment and cotton related industries. So it means that uh, cotton related industry is the backbone of Pakistan's economy. Around uh, 60% of foreign exchange we earn from our export of uh, uh, apparels and the uh, cotton and textile and garments. So uh, because you see that uh, now is a Corona crisis, but before the Corona, Pakistani government has signed an agreement with the IMF. Through that agreement, they have introduced a number of uh, different uh, kind of uh, conditionality on the people. Medicines, the prices of medicine increase, there is the privatization uh, uh, policy and other things. And they also, they have put a cut uh, and devalue the Pakistani rupee, which make inflation a lot of inflation. Now we are facing the corona crisis in a corona crisis there was a lockdown and due to lockdown uh, workers lost their jobs and also they are not getting their wages initially two million pakistani workers were retrenched from their jobs and now we are uh, calculating that around six million workers will lose their jobs so in that context there is the first time uh, there is a reward among the workers it is not like a uh, very high level, but it is a spontaneous reaction from the workers, and especially in textile and garment. You see the Zara and uh, H&M, Mango, and all these big brands, they are getting their merchandise from uh, Pakistan. H&M has uh, around 70 big uh, units who are producing for uh, H&M, and around uh, more than 100,000 workers are worked in that factories. Everywhere there is a, first is a start of a, a peaceful protest inside the factories. Then it is start to outside of the gate, uh, on the gates. Then they are on the roads. And then they become a more uh, militant in a retaliation when they were fired upon in a different factories. The government has announced uh, one law that uh, during the lockdown, every worker will get their uh, salaries and the wages and no worker will be retrenched from their job. It is a law, but 99% factories are not respecting that law and they are openly flirting, uh, avoiding this law. It's a very holy month for the Muslims and in that month, usually uh, people and the families, they spend more money. Yeah, and after the fasting, there is a Eid and more money they need it. But in that time, they, even they don't have the normal uh, wages, they are not getting their normal wages. And after that, when uh, holidays will be finished, when the worker come to back to their jobs, all the political parties, especially the main mainstream political party, they least bother about the workers' rights. So that's why only trade union and small groups are there. So now space is creating over here to have a new voices and people listen Whatever we are talking as theoretically, now they are whatever we were saying to them. Now they are witnessing and practicing all these things over here. So I think that it, this situation is not only in Pakistan, but all over the world. So the problem is a universal pro problem is a global one. So we have to have an action, a global one action. We were a part of an industrial global union, but we think that uh, industrial global unions they are not uh, coming with the uh, 
you can say that a clear message for the workers so that's why workers are thinking in a different way and they want to look to a new ways how to tackle this issue and how we unitedly we fight against what is happening at the moment clothing workers what they're doing in pakistan they are doing the same thing in bangladesh I'm Declan and the shop show for Monday in Debenhams Blanchardstown. Uh, we're here today um, because Debenhams UK stripped the Irish business of all, all of its assets. It um, sent us an email to tell us that we are being made redundant. Um, we haven't had much consultation with the uh, company at all and they've basically just left us high and dry and they're expecting the government to pick up the bill. My name is Mary Dignam. I've worked here at the Debenhams Blanchardstown shopping centre store for the last 21 years. We need, firstly, our jobs saved. We know this is possible. We've seen figures to substantiate that. Failing that, we need, and we are deserving of, a decent redundancy package. It's a, a blueprint for what may happen to other workers being dumped on the scrap, scrap heap. So fair play to them for keeping up the fight, and we need to all get behind them. And one more thing, to absolutely commend them on their act of international solidarity. They ran a GoFundMe page for workers in Bangladesh who, were, who were lost two months' salary from Debenhams. And I just think it's a magnificent and eye-watering act of solidarity. I think you've raised over 10 grand, haven't you? Oh, we're, we're on to 16,000 now. Isn't that amazing? And, and we're not even, it's not even up and running a week yet. So it won't be a week till tomorrow. Amazing. So. Well done. Just to, Tremendous act of solidarity that, that, that shows that workers of the world are all in this together. In Spain, the crisis del coronavirus has in Spain, coronavirus has had a great severe uh, crisis and has highlighted how precarious the health system was. It was a health system that was quite weakened, like in the UK, and because of this. this many deaths could have been prevented had we not been in such a precarious situation. Staff cuts have been happening for 12 years and thanks to this crisis, 200,000 health workers have been hired in Madrid. These workers want, uh, are going to be uh, fired now because uh, they say they don't need them anymore. They're, they're not taking into consideration whether there will be a, another peak. So we created a movement called Sanitarios Necesarios, which includes health workers. And we want to raise awareness about what's happening. Public health care. Y nos gustaría llevarlo ya al plano social y hacer que la lucha sea colectiva eh, con con todas las organizaciones sociales. Las, bueno, nosotros hemos propuesto una movilización el día 25 de mayo a las 8 de la tarde, que aquí en España es cuando son los aplausos a los sanitarios que ya se están acabando. Nosotros vamos a salir a esa hora para hacer una protesta silenciosa, manteniendo eh, la distancia de seguridad, para hacer ver a la población que nuestro trabajo es muy importante y muy necesario. La gente sí que tiene conciencia de que eh, es muy necesario reconstruir la sanidad porque está muy dañada, Eh, pero depende de los políticos y los políticos tienden a privatizarlo todo y a recortarlo. También apoyaremos la acción del, del 1 de junio a través de las redes sociales con una campaña masiva. parent, I'm not a teacher, but I'm standing in solidarity with the teachers unions and school workers unions, um, saying that the date of June the 1st in relation to the number of cases of COVID-19 in the UK is too soon to reopen our schools. Now, the government are saying in the media that they are only sending back um, the age four and five year olds and also then the age 10 and 11 year olds. But this isn't strictly the case. You see, the government have an umbrella term which they say vulnerable children 
and my son is a child that falls under this term. Now this can mean a disabled child, someone with special educational needs, known as SEN in our country. But it can also mean a child where, for example, there may be domestic violence in the home, um, or the, child, the child's family may have social services involved, something like that. So it is quite a broad term. A third of children in the UK currently are living in poverty. And the figure is estimated to reach 5 million children by the year 2020. So it is rather strange that suddenly Boris Johnson and our right-wing Conservative government suddenly caring about vulnerable children who haven't got enough to eat or haven't got a, home, a, a safe home. And, you know, I'm under no illusion that our government prematurely asking uh, people to get their chi our children back into school is anything other than about getting parents back into work. The, uh, the Conservatives want to scaffold the economy more than they want to put safety precautions in place to protect our lives, our children's lives and the lives of people who work with them. So what do we do? Do we bow our heads and do we obey and do we send our children, our vulnerable children, to be the canary in their minds? Well, let me tell you, 40% of children with special educational needs, like my son, have an underlying condition that puts them at high risk for COVID-19. The COVID-19 Act that the Conservative government have introduced removed all responsibility for the local authority uh, and schools to have to provide treatments, support measures and, and equipments as well to support children like my son in order that he can access a school setting in a way that is safe for him, safe for him physically, but safe for him emotionally as well because he's got sensory processing disorder, which we can't have in school right now. We can't have anything soft and fluffy. He likes to sit with this wrapped around him real tight like a little caterpillar that helps make him feel safe and let me tell you what happens when children like my son don't have access to these medically prescribed pieces of equipment that help them regulate their emotions is that they are at very real risk of coming to emotional harm it damages their emotional and psychological well-being Many children like my son might perhaps take medication to help them regulate their moods, but they do need the physical sensation of a hug, the physical sensation of massage, okay? Things like this to st stimulate the endorphins and help him feel grounded and settled as a person. Until I can send him to school where it's safe enough for him to have a hug, I will not put planks and nails across my door rather than send him. Join me. Jennifer, I will be joining you. Um, and I'll be convincing as many of my friends and parents and teachers to join together because what's going to happen on the 1st of June if we don't have a mass movement of civil disobedience is essentially thousands are going to be forced back to work. A lot of comparisons have been made about the way that Denmark is being opening its schools and there's kind of been a suggestion that we can follow the Denmark model. I just checked the ONS this evening um, and there were 3,287 people that tested positive today. In terms of the deaths today, and obviously that's probably what happened yesterday, there were 172 deaths in hospital and 351 deaths in other settings. And that's a total of 523 deaths. Let's compare that to Denmark. Denmark since the 12th of March, has only had 562 deaths in total. That's compared to the 36,000 people that we know the ONS has claimed have died as a consequence of COVID, but everyone knows it's higher because the real measure is what we call excess deaths. I'm on the executive of my national union, the National Education Union, and we have played a tremendous role in raising awareness. Our hashtag five tests campaign, I think, has been very, very thought through because we've made it absolutely clear that until those five tests are met we can't go back to safe schools and you know 20,000 teachers and support staff in a zoom meeting last Monday I think all of us would say that's the first zoom demo that, that's taken place it was phenomenal if we don't prevent more children from coming back if we don't stop unscrupulous bullies head teachers CEOs of multi-academy trusts like the one I work for, United Learning Trust, then my, my concern is that many staff will feel very vulnerable and will end up reporting to work. 
They want 15 children to go into a room all day with two members of staff, not to meet anyone else, not to play with anything else, all the equipment's been removed. Frankly, what are they bringing those children back for? I actually think that would cause a lot of psychological distress, which is unnecessary. So our strategy at the moment is that we have formed an emergency trade union health and safety committee. And today we've issued a letter to every head teacher in Greenwich. And this is, this is our, our letter. Our letter is saying, we are instructing our members not to return to work. And in a week's time, we will be carrying out health and safety inspections. We're giving every school that dares to open on the 1st of June a warning. We may be turning up to your school gates. Section 44, it's a small part of a section of a piece of legislation called the Employment Rights Act of 1996. And I have used it along with my colleagues because we shut our school a week before lockdown when we discovered that one of our parents had been tested positive and our school did very little to take any responsible actions to make us safe. My pay was threatened. My head teacher said she'd dock my pay. And I said, see you in court. Now, she didn't dock my pay. But my concern is we can't just take individual actions like that. We've got young teachers, 22 years of age, fresh out of college, being bullied, being harassed, being blackmailed. And the only way we're going to protect those individuals, along with the cleaners, along with our catering staff, who will be under the same pressure, is collective action. So I hope you join us on the 1st of June. We're planning some other bits and bobs. I'm hoping to pull off a cycle cavalcade from Blackheath, which was the origins of the peasant revolt of Watt Tyler and cycle all the way to the DFE. If anyone wants to join me, you have to do a risk assessment first because I'm a health and safety officer and I don't want to put anyone in danger. So let's do this, folks. I think we can turn things around. Parents, teachers, support staff, anybody, let's get out and let's make sure that this government doesn't think they can get away with it. In Italy, uh, a, a national response by the trade unions does not exist uh, to this day, uh, apart from a certain small trade unions such as Cobbas. Uh, Cobbas is, for instance, uh, very present in the sector of uh, logistics where we are doing great work. There hasn't been a response by most uh, uh, trade unions uh, in this regard of the most representative uh, trade unions. On the contrary, they have agreed with the government to have lockdown uh, measures. The protocols that have been set up are absolutely, uh, are recommended, are suggested, but they actually they didn't take uh, the responsibility of verifying uh, that people were truly implementing uh, lockdown uh, protocols. Uh, so there was a, a lockdown, there were some uh, restrictions in terms of a freedom of movement, but mostly uh, there was a great, uh, uh, the, the, this was mostly applied uh, to uh, public workers. COVID connected deaths are still extremely high in Italy. And as a trade union, we are trying to organize a number of initiatives. And on Mar May 26, they will be in Catanzaro in Calabria, the south of Italy, a particularly uh, precarious uh, region to demonstrate uh, against the lack of uh, staff uh, in the health sectors. They only want to hire people with uh, short-term contracts and it is not a fair or uh, adequate response. So therefore, we will demonstrate to make sure that a necessary amount of people are hired. But what we're also asking as loudly as we can is that we should start from now to have a universal health service for all workers. This is the only possible response. I'm Thea Yartz, I'm the president of a trade union, which is a trade union of young unemployed people and young precarious workers in Slovenia. And today I'm one of 15,000 people who gathered here on the streets of Ljubljana on bicycles because we are protesting against the government and against the abuse of the power 
they are taking. The reason why we're protesting now is that um, we just got a new government a couple of months ago, two months ago, which is extreme right fascist government, government taking over every aspect of democracy and using corona crisis for their own benefits. Within those two months, uh, there has been many release of corruption affairs. They are um, trying to put more power to the police and army. They are disregarding all of the democratic processes. They are using hate speech and hate attitude towards non-governmental organizations, towards media, towards people who are protesting, and uh, simple people, working class people, we simply have enough of it. Um, so we are gathering on the streets every Friday, the reason why we're doing it on the bikes is that uh, we are not allowed to protest in Slovenia right now. They are saying that due to the coronavirus, this is for our own health. Um, but uh, to be honest, Corona situation in Slovenia has improved a lot. Our government actually already announced that a pandemic is over, uh, but still they are trying to impose some of the restrictive measures in order to prevent people to meet on the streets. Um, regardless of their recommendations or threats, we are still doing it, but we're doing it on bikes so that we are moving and that officially we cannot call it a protest. Now it's the time to unite. Now it's the time to rethink the systems that we have been living because if we have to take something, some lessons learned from this corona crisis is exactly that the system that we are living right now it's failing us. It's failing so many people behind. It's not providing basic workers' rights, social rights, access to health insurance, or any kind of security for the people. So I, we really believe that now it's the time to not go to business, not go back to business as usual, but to actually change the systems that uh, are in a way that they are going to put the well-being of the citizens, of people in the front as well as the well-being of the environment. Um, so I really hope that this amazing meeting that we're having right now can be a step towards this cooperation, this solidarity beyond borders, and it's going to unite working class people around the globe.